try to do that. So let's get going. All right, unsaturated hydrocarbons. This is chapter 11. So today we're going to talk about alkenes and alkynes. We'll talk about the nomenclature of alkenes and alkynes. And then again, uh, time permitting, I'm going to probably switch gears quite a bit at the end and spend the last 20 minutes just talking about reactions in this chapter. Okay. So um, alkenes and alkynes are hydrocarbons, just like alkanes were, or cycloalkanes. They're only made of carbon and hydrogen. However, we call alkenes and alkynes, we call those unsaturated hydrocarbons because they don't have the maximum amount of hydrogens possible that could be bound to the number of carbons present in the molecule. The alkane functional group is the carbon-carbon double bond. So whenever you see this, you have two carbons with a double bond like this, and we went over functional groups quite a bit in this class. And an alkyne is when we have two carbons bound together by a triple bond. Years ago, there was an American Chemical Society conference and it was all about alkynes and they were giving out bumper stickers that said, it takes alkynes to make a world. Anyhow, the simplest possible alkene that you could have would be ethylene. And that's this molecule right here. Ethylene is used as a, and I'm not kidding, it's used as a fruit ripener to ripen things like tomatoes or cherries or whatever fruits are picked, you know, off the vine or off the tree. Um, and the simplest alkyne is ethyne or acetylene. And acetylene, um, you know, probably many of you know that it's used in welding. However, it has many other uses besides a, a gas used for welding. Anyhow, if we compare the general formulas of an alkene, an alkene and alkyne, you see that an alkane has a generic formula of CnH2n plus 2. An alkene has a generic formula of CnH2n. Why do you have two less hydrogens, <clears throat> excuse me, in an alkene than you do in an alkane? It's because every time you make a double bond, you lose two hydrogens, right? Every time you make a pi bond, you lose two hydrogens. So that's why the generic formula of an alkyne is CnH2n minus two, because you lose a total of four compared to an alkane. And so you need to have those in your hat. Something that I'll just add here quickly is that you probably noticed that a cycloalkane, a cycloalkane like cyclopentane or cyclohexane or cycloheptane, so on and so forth, they also have the generic formula CnH2n. Now, if you're wondering, well, come on, they don't have any double bonds. No, they don't. But when you make a ring, you end up losing two hydrogens just by virtue of forming a ring. Anyhow, we have our structural formulas, molecular formulas, and condensed formulas for the three, or uh, the, the two simplest, the simplest alkene and alkyne. Now keep in mind, ethane is not the simplest alkane. We could have methane, but anyhow, it's just thrown on here because it has two carbons like the other two. Anyhow, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time last class talking about conformations. And if you're like, what was conformations? Well, conformations is when you can take a carbon-carbon bond and you can rotate that bond. You see that single bond that I just circled? you can rotate that bond, right? I could take this molecule and I could spin it around. As you rotate this bond right here with that arrow, like I have shown, as you rotate around, that is called different conformations. As you rotate, you know, the carbon-carbon bond, we call those different conformations of the molecule. The difference is when you have a double or a triple bond, you cannot rotate the bond. You cannot rotate the bond. It will not rotate when you have a double bond or a triple bond. And the reason why is because when you form a pi bond, uh, the way that the orbitals overlap to form a pi bond, they cannot be rotated. Okay, it just it doesn't happen. So that is something unique <clears throat> to single bonds. They can be rotated. You should know the bond angles in a tetrahedron. The two carbons in ethane are tetrahedral. Their bond angles are 109.5. That's something that goes back to chemistry, chemistry 101 when you studied molecular geometry. The bond angles of the two carbons in ethylene are 120 degrees. They're both trigonal planar. And the bond angles in acetylene or ethyne are 180 degrees. Okay, so they're linear. So you need to know molecular geometry, bond angles. And again, that goes back to chemistry 101. All right, those are things that we need to know when we step into chemistry 102. Well, anyhow, looking some more at the whole zigzag shape. Remember we talked about the zigzag shape of um, hydrocarbons a few classes ago. We said, okay, well, let's say you had a molecule like pentane, right? You have five carbons in a row. When your pen touches the paper to make a bond line structure, you have one, two, three, four, five carbons like that. 
And that's what's shown right here, except this is a structural formula showing every single bond to hydrogen. Remember, in a bond line structure, it's implied that there's three hydrogens here, two here, two here, two here, and three here. We know that just by looking at it. And I also spoke about this um, when we were talking about this zigzag. Now, let's say you had five carbons, but you have a double bond at the end like that. Well, you cannot, or sorry, you can draw a zigzag when you have a double bond. So one, two, three, four, five, like this. However, and this is what I was getting at, when you have a single bond, a single bond cannot be drawn like this. So you can't draw a triple bond and then put a bond down like that. That is big time wrong. And if you're wondering why is that so wrong, the reason it's wrong is because remember this bond angle is 180 degrees. So the first two carbons, these ones here that I'm circling in blue, those would be these two right here, carbon number one, carbon number two, right? So off of, off of carbon number two, so I have my triple bond, then I have one, two, three, four, five, like that. And that is how I would draw the bond line structure of this molecule. If you don't follow me, again, look, I have one, two, three, four, five carbons, like that, okay? And remember, when a carbon has a triple bond, it is gonna be having a linear geometry, like that. Okay, um, the multiple bond is always drawn when we draw a condensed structure. There's no way to condense a double bond. Okay, so if you have a big organic molecule and you wanna draw a condensed structure, if there's double bonds, sorry, but there's no way to condense those. The same thing with a triple bond, you have to include them. Okay, so even if you condense this alkene, you still have to keep the double bond. And even if you condense an alkyne, you still have to keep the triple bond in a condensed structure. Physical properties, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we could spend all day on. But again, the, the same thing applies to alkenes and alkynes um, that does to alkenes in that they're both hydrocarbons. And so alkenes and alkynes are going to be nonpolar. They're not going to be soluble in water because water is polar, but they're going to be soluble in nonpolar solvents. And you know what? You're just kind of learning organic chemistry. So if you're wondering, what's an organic solvent, Mr. Dion? Well, organic solvents would be things like benzene. So, and, and this might come up in the book. So benzene, there's another one called toluene. If you don't know what it is, I'm going to teach it to you. Um, benzene, toluene, another good one would be hexane. Hexane is a liquid at room temperature. And as the course progresses, we'll see even more and more examples of, um, of, uh, of uh, organic, nonpolar organic solvents. But of course, boiling points are gonna rise with molecular weight. Why is that? It goes back to the Velcro analogy I told you, right? If you just had to pull apart a piece of Velcro that's one inch long, it doesn't take a lot of energy. But if you had a piece of uh, Velcro that was say 10 yards long, it takes a lot of energy to pull that apart. Why? because there's more contact, there's more surface area in contact. And the longer the molecule, the more surface area there's gonna be, and therefore there's gonna be stronger intermolecular forces and boiling point is gonna rise. All right, well, let's move on from there. Let's get into nomenclature. You need to know how to name alkenes and alkynes in this class. And as you can guess, um, you start by finding the longest carbon chain. However, when you're naming an alkene and alkyne, the caveat is that the longest carbon chain has to has to contain the multiple bond, okay? It has to contain the double or the triple bond. Once you find the longest name or the longest chain, let's say it's got five carbons. If you had a five carbon alkane, it would be pentane. If it's a five carbon alkene, it becomes pentene. If it's a five carbon alkyne, it becomes pentyne. So ene is the suffix for the parent chain for an alkene and ine is the suffix for the parent chain of an alkyne. Then when it comes to numbering, it's even simpler than alkanes and that you number from the end that gives the multiple bond, whether it's a double or a single, you want to give that multiple bond the lowest possible number. Then you're going to prefix the name with the number of the first multiple bond carbon. And if you're like, what does that mean? Well, that means if it was, say, a one pentene or a two pentene or if you had a one octane or a three oct or sorry, a one octene or a three octene. So I'll, we'll do some examples to um, clarify that. And then you just prefix your branches and substituents the same way you did for alkanes. So that means when you step into the exam, you need to know methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl, butyl, terbutyl, secbutyl, iso, isobutyl. You need to know all of those alkyl groups when you see them as substituents. Take a look at these. These are some really simple ones. Here you have ethene, or sorry, ethane, ethene and ethine. So all of these molecules just have 
two carbons. And if you have three carbons, we go from propane to propene to propine, like that. Now, before we move on, I want to show you something about this rule right here. Okay, I want to explain this rule in a little bit more detail. Let's say we had four carbons, right? Then it gets a little bit more interesting. And I'm going to use bond line structures. If I had a four carbon hydrocarbon, one, two, three, four, this is not a trick question. Could anybody name that molecule for me? Butane. Yeah, exactly. So this is butane. Okay. But look, when I want to put a double bond in butane, there's two possibilities. Okay. If I draw my butane molecule, like this, I could put the double bond here and I could put it here. Now, if you're wondering, hey, Mr. Dion, can I put the double bond here? Well, these two molecules would be identical. So technically, no, you can't do that. Okay, so let's look at these two molecules. And these two molecules are not identical, are they? The double bond is between carbons one and carbons two for the first one or the one on the top. And the double bond is between carbons two and three for the second. Let me show you what I mean. Our longest carbon chain contains four carbons, and we number it to give the double bond the lowest possible number. One, two, three, four. Down here, we have one, two, three, four. This is a symmetrical molecule. It wouldn't matter if you went one, two, three, four. Either way, you'd get the same thing. So what's the name of the molecule on top? Well, the molecule on top is some kind of butene. The first number on the double bond, that's what we, get, that's what we prefix the parent with. And so this one would be one butene, and this one would be two butene, like that. Okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can follow, follow me on that idea. All right, great. Okay, well, if we look at these two, uh, two molecules that I've drawn on the left, or sorry, on the right, these are both alkynes. If I number the carbons, I have one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. These compounds are both isomers of each other, aren't they? They have the same molecular formula, right? But one of them has the triple bond between uh, carbons one and two. And so this would be one butyne, and this would be two butyne. Now, before we move on to the next slide, let me clarify one more thing. The reason why you don't have a number in front of ethene, propene, ethyne, and propine is because it wouldn't, it would be totally meaningless. There's only one place to put a double or triple bond in any of these four molecules. Okay. Once you get to four, four carbon atoms and beyond, then it gets trickier. Right. But for the for two carbons or three carbons, there's only one possible place to put it. All right. Well, with that in mind, let's keep going. Okay, how to name uh, an alkene and alkyne. Uh, so it says here, give the IUPAC name of each alkene. Uh, well, I've kind of helped you out with this one a little bit, but I want you to take a look at A and B and just take a second and see if you can come up with a name for those. All right, so if I look at A, you can see that the longest carbon chain that contains the double bond is the one that's highlighted in brown. One, two, three, four. The reason we can't start numbering here with number one is because we want to give the carbons with the double bond the lowest possible number, right? So this must be some kind of one butene, and we have one substituent. It's a methyl. It's a carbon three, so this is a three methyl, and so this molecule becomes three methyl 1-butene. If we look at B, again, the longest carbon chain is the one that's highlighted in brown. It's kind of training wheels here. We want to give the triple bond the lowest possible numbers for the carbon. So 1, 2, 3, Not. 4, 5, 6. You need to listen to this. Okay, like that. So this must be some kind of 2-hexine, right? 2-hexine. And then I have an ethyl group at carbon four. So this is a four ethyl. So we have four ethyl, four ethyl, two hexine like that. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on those two examples of naming an alkene and an alkyne. 
All right, good. Okay, well let's uh, let's keep put moving. more. Let's keep moving. If you have your mic on, if you could mute it, that would be great. Um, and let's take a look at these two here. So this is just some, you know, a little bit of practice here. I'll give you a second to look at it. And we'll give this one the old college try. Well, you can probably see the longest carbon chain of the one on the top is this one here. And if you said, Mr. Dion, I did it this way, you're gonna end up with the same answer. If you did it this way, you're gonna end up with the same answer. And if you did it this way, you're gonna end up with the same answer, okay? As long as you find the longest carbon chain, you're gonna end up with the same answer. So we wanna number the molecule in such a way or num number the longest chain that I have highlighted in yellow in such a way that we give the carbons with the double bond the lowest possible number. Could anybody tell me, am I gonna start numbering from the left or from the right in this molecule? The right. right. Exactly, so I wanna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? If I'd started numbering over here, I'd have one, two, three, four, right? And three is lower than four. And so um, it's an alkene. And so this must be some kind of three heptene, right? That's what kind of molecule we've got here is some kind of three heptene. And then we have two substituents on that molecule. We've got a, we've got a three, we've got a three ethyl. And we've got a 6-methyl, six 6-methyl. Six and so when we put all of that together, we're going to alphabetize. E comes before M. And so the molecule is 3-ethyl, 3-ethyl, 6-methyl, 3-heptene, like that, OK? Um, and then the one on the bottom is an alkyne. Now this one's kind of an interesting example because there's a tiebreaker here, right? If you started numbering from here, one, two, three, or if you started numbering from here, one, two, three, either way you'd get the same answer, right? You'd end up with a three hexine. But the correct answer is actually to start numbering from the left-hand side because if you have a symmetrical molecule like this, or a symmetrical chain, I should say, you start on the end that's gonna give the substituent the lowest number. You kind of go down to the next rule. So if one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. So this is some kind of, so we have a two methyl. So this molecule is two methyl three hexane, like that. Okay, well, let's look at something that's maybe a little more interesting to name. Molecules with more than one double bond. Now we won't look at a ton of examples of these, but you do kind of have to know um, what they are and how to recognize them and what to do if you run into one on the street, you know, you got to know what to do. So if you have more than one double bond, we call that a diene. If you have, or sorry, if you have two double bonds, we call it a diene. Uh, if you have three triple bonds, we call it a triene, tetraene, so on and so forth. Um, the same rules as for alkynes and, and alkenes, okay? Um, so if you have, let's say you have a molecule like this, you have two double bonds, you number it in such a way, so you have two and four, so this is two, four hexadiene. Um, you have a double bond, it started at carbon one and a carbon four, so it's one, four pentadiene, right? Because you've got two. Um, same thing here in the bottom left. This one here is kind of interesting though. Um, again, you want to give the double bonds the lowest possible numbers. So with this molecule, it's kind of cool because the reason you start here is because you have one, two, three, and you have a three methyl, right? If you had started here, right, one, two, three, four, five, you'd still have one and four, right, for your um, cyclohexadiene, but you'd have a six for your methyl. So it wouldn't give the methyl the lowest possible number. So in organic chemistry, when you're naming molecules, you always follow the same old rules over and over and over. Well, let me show you one that's a that's a big one that the ACS loves to ask. OK, so the ACS is the American Chemical Society. They love to ask their students or you guys about how to name cycloalkenes. And the reason why is because it's tricky and it's not because it's a trick. It's because it's tricky or sometimes it can confuse people. So let me explain it to you the best I can. OK, just like we saw cycloalkenes, if we have a cycloalkene, 
right? We prefix it with cyclo. So if we have cyclopropene, cyclobutene, cyclopentene, uh, cyclohexene, so on and so forth. So here's the killer rule, okay? This is the rule that students just want to ignore. And the reason why is I've come to the conclusion that it must not be intuitive. It is for me because I've been doing this for 25 years. But I've come to the conclusion that it might not be intuitive for students. Let me show you the rule. It says numbering of the double bond must start at one end of the double bond and it's got to go through the double bond. So if you have, let's say, a cyclohexene derivative like this, okay, the first one's got to go here and the second one's got to go like this, okay? You always have to go start going through the double bond, right? You start here, you go through it, okay? Even if there's a substituent that looks like it's really close and you're like, oh, I could give it a lower number, you always have to go through the double bond. So if we look at this molecule right here, we see that it's 5-chloro-3-methyl cyclohexene. Watch why it is. Look, if we number it through going this way, um, one, sorry, I wanted a different color, one, two, three methyl, four, five, five. So look, this becomes 5-chloro, 3-methyl cyclohexene, right? Because you have your double bond here, right? This molecule is cyclo, cyclohexene, okay? I'm going to delete all that. And oops, I didn't mean to delete that. Anyhow, let me show you what would happen if we went the other way. And you'll understand why it's jacked up. If we had gone this way, if we said 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you still have cyclohexene, but now the problem is you've got 4-chloro and 6-methyl, right? So now you've got a higher um, uh, a higher number for the first substituent, a 4, when it could have been a 3, okay? Anyhow, so that's that's the rule, okay? And if you're like, oh, I'm still not 100% sure, Mr. Dion, well, let's take a look at another example. Now, before we go on to another example and really get into it here, I just want to stop for a quick second here and tell you that students, uh, I've noticed this is another mistake students tend to make. You guys know what an aromatic ring is by now? You've seen enough of those. This is aromatic, okay? The name of this molecule is actually benzene. This is C6H6. If you draw this, okay, this is cyclohexane, cyclohexane, okay? That is something completely different. And if you take cyclohexane and you put a double bond in it, like that somewhere. This is cyclohexene. This is not benzene, okay? Students confuse these two for some reason. And if even if you put two double bonds in it, right? If you do this like that, okay? That would be one, two, three. So this would be one, three, cyclohexadiene, okay? Um, so don't get those confused. Anyhow, let's continue on. And this is just going over the same rule that we just looked at here. Nothing more. It's just another example. And again, this was the first question on, on a final exam, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago or something. Anyhow, again, the double bond is located between carbon one and carbon two. So we have to go through that double bond. So look, <clears throat> if I'm going to name this molecule right here, I'm going to start on this as carbon one. Right, because if I started over here, one, two, then this would be two methyl cyclopentene. I always want to give the locant the lowest possible number, right? The first substituent. So this is the killer right here. Okay, this one right here is the hardest one for students because students want to do this. One, two, three. Look at that. Two, three dimethyl cyclohexene. Right? That's way lower than um that's that's way lower than uh, one and six. You know, you add them up. It's got nothing to do with adding things up. It has nothing to do with that at all. Let me explain why. Okay, the way that I did it here, you did go through the double bond, right? One, two, but the problem is you want to give what? The first substituent, the lowest possible number. Okay, so if you start here, you have a one methyl, right? If you started here, you'd have a two methyl. One is lower than two. It's got nothing to do with getting at a calculator or an abacus or a mainframe computer or something. It's simpler than that. You just give the first substituent the lowest possible number and the rest of them, to hell with them. Let the chips fall where they may, okay? So, and again, I'm repeating myself here like an old man, but whatever. So we have to go through this bond. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have one six dimethyl cyclohexene. 
give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that concept because it'll probably show up on your exam and maybe on the final. You know, I don't have the finals memorized, you know, the ACS finals, but uh, I've seen them enough, you know, that I have some of the questions memorized. And if I have one memorized, I'll always throw it in my students' way. Um, naming Hallowell Keens says here, double or triple bonds take precedence over any halogen or alkyl group. Um, so, you know, there's really nothing new on this slide. You treat it, so, you know, want me to summarize this slide? If I had 10 seconds to summarize this slide to you, this is what I would say. Treat a, ha treat a halogen just like you would an alkyl group. That's it, okay? Chloro, bromo, iodo, fluoro, just treat them like you would a methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, so on and so forth, okay? Treat them the exact same way. Um, there we go. Geometric isomers, this is a good one because I spoke to you this evening about how a double bond has restricted rotation, right? Restricted rotation around a double bond. And that results in something called cis-trans isomers. So if we look at these two molecules here, okay? If we look at these two molecules here, the question is, are they the same molecule? And the answer is no, they are not the same molecule. If you look at the double bond in both of these, on the first one, you can see the two chlorines are on the same side of the double bond. But on the other one, the chlorines are on the opposite sides of the double bond. They both have the exact same molecular formula. Both of these molecules are C2H2Cl2. But the way the atoms are arranged in space is different. Okay? You cannot rotate around this bond. Cannot happen. Cannot rotate around that bond. And so we have two different molecules. And you need to know the difference between cis and trans. How do I identify cis and trans isomers? If one end of the carbon-carbon double bond has two groups that are the same, you can't have cis-trans isomers. Let me show you why. If I draw an alkene, okay, like this, and if I have a methyl group here and a methyl group here, and I have another methyl group here, that can't be cis or trans. Why, Mr. Dion? Because these two groups are trans to each other, and these two groups are cis, so there's no cis or trans. You can't, you can't uh, designate it as cis or trans. The rule is that both carbons of the double bond have to have two different groups attached, okay? So that means if I attach, let's say, I don't know, um, a chlorine over here, and I had a methyl group here, and I had a methyl group here, and I had a bromine here, well, since the two methyl groups are identical and they're opposite of each other, they're it, that molecule would be trans, okay? And also, if the common group is on the same side of the pi bond, it's cis, okay? So well, let's look at some more examples here. Um, take a look at this one here. Why is this molecule trans 2,3-dichloro-2-pentene? Because the two chlorines are on the opposite sides of the double bond. That makes it trans. Nothing more than that. And the rest of it is just identifying the longest carbon chain. It's five carbons. It's got a double bond on carbon number one, two, three. So the double bond starts on carbon two. So it's a two pentene. It's trans. And we have two, three dichloro, two pentene. Nothing more than that. If we look at this, these three molecules here and we look at the decision as to why um, these are cis or trans, you can see that in the one on the top left, the two methyl groups are on opposite sides of the double bond, right? They're trans to each other. If we look at the next one, there's no cis or trans in this molecule because here I have an isopropyl and here I have an isopropyl. And if you say, well, come on, Mr. Dion, the methyl is, is cis to this. Well, it's trans to this and those are identical. So there's no cis or trans. And then finally, in this one, we see that the two hydrogens are on the same side, so those are cis. You know what, you could also write for this one, you could say ethyls, ethyls are cis, and that would be it. And if you're like, well, which one is it? Both would be a reasonable argument. Wouldn't matter, the two ethyls are cis like that. Anywho, there we go. Um, if you've ever wondered about the fatty acids and unsaturated fats and trans fats and those kinds of things, well, fatty acids are just 
um, uh, fats that have long hydrocarbon chains attached to them. And they usually have a double bond in that, or they always have a double bond in an unsaturated fat, like um, not a fate, a fat, a fat from, let's say, an avocado or nuts or something like that, whereas saturated fats are found in animal fats like tallow or something like that. Anyhow, there we go. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead because we don't have a lot of time left. And again, I've posted all the videos to my YouTube channel, which cover all of this content. But I want to go over one thing with a couple of things with you before we call it a night for this evening. And that is addition reaction. So adding, um, adding uh, reactants to a double bond. This is a big part of chapter 11, our addition reaction. So it says here, reactions involving alkenes and alkynes. Well, what are alkenes and alkynes? Um, how do they differ from alkanes? They differ because they have pi bonds. And pi bonds, pi bonds are weaker, weaker than sigma bonds, okay? Pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds. So that's why alkenes and alkynes are more reactive than alkenes. So there's two types of reactions that are um, of interest to us with respect to alkenes, addition reactions and redox reactions. The two classes are not always mutually exclusive. Well, we'll worry about that when we get there. Let's talk about an addition reaction first. If we take an alkene and we add a small molecule to it, our small molecule is A and B. What kind of a small molecule would be A and B, Mr. Dion? I don't know, um, lots of examples. It could be something like HCl, right, Hyd hydrogen chloride. It could be Cl2, right? Those are examples that fall under the AB category, right? Something like that, okay? Well, a small molecule like AB can react with the pi electrons of the double bond. What we end up doing is we break the pi bond. So we break the pi bond. We add A to one of the carbons and we add B to the other carbon. Okay, so that's all that's happening here. And since carbon can't have five bonds, the pi bond is gone. And that's an re addition reaction. It says here that some additions require a catalyst. We will look at examples um, that require a catalyst. So the types of addition reactions. Remember, we're talking about adding that small molecule, A, B. What are the types of A, B? The first one would be something that's symmetrical, like H2, hydrogen gas, Br2, Cl2. If you're wondering, why not F2? And I2, Mr. Dion, well, the reason we don't use those is because F2, fluorine, reacts so fast that it will cause an explosion. And I'm not kidding, like violent explosions. And I2 will react so slow that it's useless, okay? We don't have that kind of time. Unsymmetrical, something like I told you, HCl, HBr, H2O. And if you're thinking, hey, Mr. Dion, H2O doesn't have, that's got more than two atoms in it. That's got three atoms. Well, hold on. When we think about water being in an AB format, we write it like this, H2O. So the hydrogen over here is kind of like the A, and the OH is like the B, like that. And then self-addition or polymerization, that might be worth the value of one multiple choice question on your upcoming exam. Let's start with hydrogenation. So if we take an alkene and we combine it with hydrogen, what do we do? We mix up our double bond. We mix up H2, right? This is the Lewis structure of H2, just hydrogen gas, H2, okay? What do we do? We break the pi bond. We attach one of the hydrogens to this carbon and one of the hydrogens to the other carbon. And what do we end up with? We end up with an alkane. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. We break the pi bond. We make one bond from one carbon to one hydrogen and one bond from the other carbon to the other hydrogen. That's an addition reaction. Nothing more than that. All right, cool. Again, um, is with respect to the whole catalyst thing, the types of catalysts that are needed for hydrogenation are things like palladium, platinum, or nickel. These, again, are catalysts, okay? And it says platinum, palladium, or nickel. If you were to ask me, well, come on, Mr. Dion, what do I do? Just throw in all these metals? Uh, the answer is no. You would usually use one of them. And then if you're, I know what you're thinking then. They go, well, well, then, come on, Mr. Dion, which one is it? If I put palladium, are you going to grade me wrong? No. You can put any one of those three because they all have their specific places. And it also says that sometimes we need to heat these reactions up or do them under pressure. Now, if you're really astute, you might notice that there's 
some danger associated with this because you're using hydrogen, which is an explosive gas, isn't it, right? If it's, it's highly flammable, it can cause explosions. So something to think about. And uh, I've done, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hydrogenations when I worked in industry. Anyhow, fun stuff. Again, um, just a symmetrical addition. So the addition of X2 and X2, X2 can only be Cl2 or Br2. Again, it's never going to be F2. Okay, you're never going to see that and you're never going to see I2, not in this lifetime. Okay, so if you add Cl2, right, Cl2, you'd have Cl2 like that, or if you had Br2, it looks like this. The same thing you did with the hydrogenation. You break the pi bond, you add one bond to one X, and you add one bond from carbon to the other X. Okay, so you end up with a, di a dihalide. Anyhow, you don't need a catalyst for this. No catalyst required. So only for the hydrogenation reaction do you need a, a catalyst. All right. Anyhow, there we go. So um, here's an example of <clears throat> somebody doing um, a halogenation reaction. So inside this bottle here, there's ethylene gas. At least that's what I'm pretty sure is in here. Why is my thing doing that? Here we go. So we have ethylene gas, which is an unsaturated hydrocarbon, right? This is an alkene. Okay, so that's a gas in a tank here. And then what they're doing is they're taking a solution of um, bromine, which is, so in here, this is Br2 in, a, in some kind of solvent. So this is Br2 liquid in some kind of solvent. And BR, bromine is a red solid. And then what they're doing is they had bromine in here and then they bubbled this gas into it. And what it did is it did this reaction. So you started with the gas, right, the ethylene, and then you combine it with the bromine, which is red, right, and when you mix it, you get this. You end up with this molecule, so you have the two carbons, but now you've got one, two hydrogens and a bromine, and one, two hydrogens and a bromine, and this is colorless. So it's almost like a titration here. Anyhow, but that's what's going on in this slide here, kind of a neat reaction. All right, the next one is a hydration reaction where you take, take an alkene, you treat it with water. Again, I told you that you can write water in the A, B format where B is the whole OH and A is just one of the hydrogens. So again, and I'm repeating it, this is the third time, right? We break the double bond, we break the pi bond. We make one bond to the A, which is the hydrogen. We make the other bond to the B, which is the OH and you end up with an alcohol. So it's kind of cool, you can take an alkene and you treat it with water and you end up with an alcohol. Now notice that you don't just throw an alkene in water and walla walla bing bang, you've got your alcohol. Notice that you need something special. You need an acid, right? An acid in chemistry is represented by H plus, like that, because an acid is a proton donor. It's an H plus donor. All right, so this is your initiation. This is your real initiation into converting an organic compound with one functional group, an alkene, into a new organic compound with a different functional group, an alcohol. Kind of a cool reaction. All right, so here's what we've learned so far. It was the same thing every time. We take an alkene, okay, just a double bond. We treat it with H2, X2, which again could be Cl2 or Br2, HX, which could be HCl or HBr, or we treat it with H2O, and again, I told you you write it like this, H2O right, the A, B format, right, the H, C, L, for example, this would be the A, this would be the B, right, so on and so forth. Maybe I'm getting into too much detail here, but, um, oops, I wanted to keep that there, like that. So on one carbon, you put one of the substituents, and on the other carbon, you put the other substituents. So now you've learned four types of reactions, right? You've learned hydrogenation, halogenation, hydrohalogenation, and hydration, right? Hydrogenation, you're only adding hydrogen. Halogenation, you're adding a halogen, chlorine or bromine, right? Cl2 or Br2. Hydrohalogenation means you're adding a hydrogen and a halogen, for example, like HCl or HBr. And hydration means you're adding H2O, right? Water. There you go. So you learn some really cool reactions and some cool names of them. Well, the last thing that I want to cover with you is unsymmetrical addition. OK, 
Okay, and this is something called Markovnikov addition. I can't stress this enough. You need to understand Markovnikov addition for the first exam. So if we have a molecule like propene, okay, shown here, we call this an unsymmetrical alkene. If you're like, what's so unsymmetrical about it? Let's look at the two carbons in the double bond. The carbon labeled number one, can anybody tell me how many hydrogens are directly attached to the carbon, to the carbon that's labeled one, the one that's yellow? How many hydrogens are attached to that? Thanks, Gavin. The answer is two. How many hydrogens are directly attached to the carbon labeled two, the one in green? And it's not a trick. One. Exactly. So which one of those carbons, the yellow one or the green one, is richer in hydrogens? Who's got more hydrogens? What's a bigger number, two or one? Two, so it's one. Exactly. This one is the richer, right? It's richer in hydrogens. Okay, so when I do an addition on that double bond, the question becomes, okay, well, if I'm going to add my A and B, where does A go and where does B go? Does the A go here or does it go over here, right? Okay, well, the answer is this. Markovnikov's rule states that the rich, the rich get richer. Okay, a real comment for 2021, right? Anyhow, the rich get richer. So the answer is this. Whichever carbon has the more hydrogens, which in this case is this one, that one takes the hydrogen. Okay, the other carbon is going to take the OH. So that's why this compound, 2-propanol, is the major product, and this one here is the minor product. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that idea. The carbon that has the more hydrogens is going to take the hydrogen, just like this, and the other one is going to be left over with the hydroxyl, the OH. Okay, that is Markovnikov's rule. And we see that not only for water addition, but we also see it for HCl and HBr. So you have to be fully aware of Markovnikov's rule for the quiz, okay, or for the exam. All right, hydrogenation of alkynes is a little bit weird. It's a little strange because you actually make a new functional group that wasn't in the list that I showed you. And you're like, what? There's more functional groups? Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of functional groups, okay? And throughout the course, I'll probably throw a new functional group at you here and there, but here's one for you right now. If you try the same thing with an alkyne, for example, you do the same thing. You break one of the double bonds, the H goes on one, and the OH goes on the other, okay? So we end up with a hydrogen on one and an OH on the other. And we make a new functional group. Are you ready? It's called an enol. That comes from alkene. Okay, I do know how to spell alkene. Alkene and alco. Hall, right? You get enol, okay? And there's an alkene in it and there's an alcohol on the same carbon. But what happens is that the, the, um, the enol undergoes what's called isomerization. It just rearranges like a transformer, okay? And it forms either an aldehyde or a ketone. So it just undergoes this rearrangement. All right, so Markovnikov addition. Um, hydrohalogenation, the exact same rule. We follow Markovnikov's rule. If we look at the two carbons, this carbon of the double bond has two hydrogens. This carbon of the double bond, oops. This carbon of the double bond only has one hydrogen. This one is richer, richer in H's. So it's going to take the H and the other carbon is going to take the Br and that's going to give you the major product. Now, you keep wondering, Hey, Mr. Dion, you keep showing minor products. So does, does some of the opposite happen? And the answer is, yeah, some does. Not a lot. And, and it will depend, you know, on case by case. I'm never going to ask you to calculate, you know, how many molecules. You, no, no. It's just a matter of knowing Markovnikov's rule. All right. Uh, let's see here. So make sure you're aware of or that you know this well. Again, um, because of the pandemic, we have to end Monday night's lecture, Monday night lectures early. But be sure you are aware of uh, Markovnikov's rule. Make sure you look at section 11.6, which deals with aromatic hydrocarbons, which talks about benzene. You are also responsible for the structure to know the names of several. 
several um, common aromatic compounds. So you have to have all these memorized. Again, if you watch the lectures, you'll see that it explains you have to have these molecules memorized, toluene, phenol, aniline, benzoic acid, all that. Talks with disubstituted benzenes, ortho, meta, para. You need to cover all that. Nomenclature of benzene, uh, that's covered. Again, all of this is covered in my slides. Nomenclature, when you have a common root, um, that's covered. Benzene, when it's a substituent, it's called a phenyl. I go over that in my slides. Polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, it's a very brief part. Reactions of benzene, so this is another part that unfortunately we don't have time to go over live, but um, I have some questions or a couple of questions I think about that on the practice exam. So make sure you go through all the videos in gross and gory detail. And of course, if you have a question of you know, something that you're attempting and you're not getting the right answer, of course, you want to ask me about that. And then the last section deals with heterocycles. So the only heterocycles that I ask you to memorize for the first exam are pyridine. You have to know the structure of pyridine. It comes up so much in this class. And then it gives you a little blurb about hemoglobin and RNA and all that stuff. And there you go. That's, that's what chapter 11 is all about, my friends. So again, there's no way for you to master that content in the amount of time that we had this evening. So be sure to 